dog, you don't get your hand out my wife's face, I'm gonna slap a muzzle on you. I know it's late, but I really need to talk. We're going to show you some clips uh, from across your career and have you react to them, if that's all right. Okay, some of them may go back as far as silent movies, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Grab a bucket oh, and mop. Yes. Scrub the bottom and top. There I was uh, so making a living and That's supporting my family team. exclusively from doing what commercials at know? one point. I enjoyed that. And the funny part about it was, I, I in real life, I had gone to work for McDonald's up in Canada in the very first unit. And uh, it was like life was imitating art or art imitating life. I don't know which came first. But uh, it was a wonderful time in my life and in my career. I enjoyed working for and with McDonald's. And then to be Mr. McDowell's and coming to America, mm, that put the whipped cream on the cake. They got the golden arches. Mine is the golden arcs. <laughs> What I remember about working on it was that I got paid the grand sum of $60 and I had to furnish my own motorcycle, which I did. And uh, Melvin, I met Melvin in, in an apartment building. I heard he was directing a movie and he had a somewhat of a reputation in the black community as an up and coming filmmaker, uh, though nobody in the uh, community knew the impact that that movie, Sweetback's Badass Song, was gonna have. I was extremely fortunate, extremely fortunate to have formed a relationship with Norman Lear that allowed me to work for him in, what, almost three or four different projects in addition to Good Times the pilots that we tried to do together. And to this day, most recently, the reunion of myself and the depiction of good times in the, where they recapitulated it. And actually I got to play opposite myself, <laughs> which was a unique experience. meant so much to me on so many levels. One, as an actor on a professional level, I couldn't believe that I had gotten that role. And when the final decision came down from the, from the directors and those involved in that process, and they told me that you got the role of Kunta Kinte, I was moved to, to tears because I knew what it was, I knew what it, it, it I knew how important a role it was. I had read the scripts to the character uh, being introduced and his development as far as they had gotten at that point. And I knew that it was a life changing role for me as an actor, as a professional. And um, from a social standpoint, just from a humanistic standpoint, it was the culmination of all of the misconceptions and, and stereotypical roles that I had lived and seen being offered to me, many of which I rejected. Okay, Lisa. He's rich. He is rich. What? He's got his own money. And baby, when I tell you he's got his own money, I mean the boy has got his own money. I remember money. it being what? such a well-written scene that any part of it stands up on its own. And when he had me playing that character, so uh, free that I, I, whatever greed that I felt that Mr. McDowell had, I had got a chance to exhibit it in that scene. I mean, it was just the idea that his daughter had hit the jackpot. This, this was better than being on the Price is Right as far as he was concerned. So I loved it. And all that activity, including the dog and answering the door, and the, it just 
it, it was like a well choreographed ballet as far as I was concerned. I enjoyed it so much. Uh, well, we've got two more clips if you have time, and if not, that's okay, but I really appreciate your time regardless. I am enjoying this because you're making me remember certain points in my career that might be laying there, uh, you know, not remembered for the next decade or so. Problem with that is that's what they were saying about me 50 years ago. Blacks shouldn't serve with whites. It would disrupt the unit. You know what? It did disrupt the unit. The unit got over it. The unit changed. I love that scene as written because while Fitz Wallace, the character that I was portraying, had the opportunity to address uh, institutional grievances uh, and to, to express himself, he never had to raise his voice. He never had to become uh, demonstrative in his feelings, you know, to the point that it became so one-sided. I'm an admiral in the U.S. Navy and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Beat that with a stick. I love the way that Aaron Sorkin had written this character's dialogue as it reflected on the man's position in the military. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. That in itself and his accomplishments while jo after joining the military that spoke volumes, and I, I just love the succinctness of Aaron Sorkin's dialogue. When in the close of that, now beat that, it was like tossing a gauntlet. Like, are you going to continue with this charade of inequities, or uh, not? And I, I just love good writing, and you couldn't ask for better writing than that given to the actors and the cast of uh, the West Wing. I feel. You're not just a father. You're the king, and heavy lies the head that wears the crown. It's not so much the crown that is so heavy. It's everything that comes with it. Hmm? Eddie is so adept at staying focused in a scene that it was only when I I really, really got to appreciate it in, in, in Coming to America 2, the one we just completed. And it would be the scene in which Eddie is, or rather Prince Akeem, is being given some very, very helpful advice by my character. We just searched each other's souls, it seemed, when we did that scene. We took our time. It wasn't a very long scene, but as far as I was concerned, it was a pivotal scene. Well, Mr. Amos, I think we're all learning so much from you and from your history. And I'm excited for everybody to see the movie and, um, and everything else that you have in store for us. I thank you. And the way things have been going, I've got a lot more in store for all of you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much and take care. Be safe. You too.